Welcome to the start of our webinar series on design patterns by example with C++. We're going to begin by giving an overview of patterns, helping you recognize the importance of design experience in the quest to become a master software developer. We'll also define a bit about what patterns are and demonstrate how they help to improve the quality of software and productivity of software by codifying this design experience. It's probably fair to say that people who are experts at almost any field do things differently than novices. If you know, or if you are an expert martial artist, an expert dancer, an expert athlete, an expert musician, or so on, undoubtedly, either you work through those different fields effortlessly and fluidly playing your scales, playing your notes, doing your katas, doing your dances, doing your strokes in a way that many beginners would struggle with. And one of the reasons you do that, of course, is you don't have to stop and think about each of the movements, each of the activities. It becomes very much second nature. When we watch experts perform at the height of their craft, it's often easy to forget how much effort they put into reaching those high levels of achievement. Obviously, some people are born with a knack for something, and so it's, they can become good at it without having to do much effort. But for most of us, myself included, Crucial to becoming an expert is to put in plenty of repetition and practice so that you learn over and over again. For example, when I was young, I took karate and we practiced blocks and kicks and punches over and over and over again until they became second nature. Later, I also played a lot of music. And once again, I practiced scales, I would learn songs, chord progressions and so on, on guitar and on piano and other instruments until they became second nature as well. And believe me, I was not the same the first or second day I picked up the guitar as after I'd been playing for 15 to 20 years. Something else that's also important to gain mastery in almost any field is being able to mentor or be mentored by other experts. So when I was learning martial arts, for example, we had a sensei who was very good at black belt karate. And so he would show us the kicks and moves and punches and the katas and the forms, and we would mimic his behavior and learn by example and learn by his mentorship to see what things we could do to improve the way that we practiced our craft. The key point I wanna make with this intro is at the heart of all these activities is knowledge of and mastery of patterns, whether they be scales, whether they be foot movements in a dance, whether they be the punches, blocks and kicks in martial arts or any type of other activity where you have to practice over and over again, learning how to do things effectively, learning how to do things to the point where they become second nature by mentoring from others is crucially important to your success. Well, let's focus a bit away from martial arts and athletics and music and focus on the real essence of why you probably come to hear this discussion. And that's the importance of software design and more importantly, software design experience at learning how to develop effective software and become a master software developer. Now, if you wanna become a master software developer, it's necessary but not sufficient to have expertise with a number of things. One thing it helps to be an expert at is how to either understand or draw notations of your software designs. And of course, nowadays we use things like the unified modeling language, UML, in order to capture the common roles and relationships between the elements in our software, uh, showing the software structure, so showing its behavior. And UML is very common. You're, you're likely to see it all the time in books, in reverse engineered code from things like Java docs and so on. And it basically allows you to show the structure of your software. You can demonstrate the abstract classes, which are often italicized. You can have a number of operations in there, which may be abstract or concrete. You can demonstrate subclass relationships by using the diamond uh, icon to demonstrate that one concrete subclass inherits from an abstract class, and so on and so forth. And there's other kinds of relationships like object references and aggregation and one-to-many relationships and so on and so forth. So I recommend you take a look at the link at the bottom of the page if you wanna learn more about UML. This is by no means a UML tutorial, but it helps to understand UML in order to make sense of the class diagrams, especially the structure diagrams, and sometimes the interaction diagrams we use throughout this webinar series in order to demonstrate the structure and participants in the patterns we're describing. Naturally, it's also the, the important to become a master at algorithms, either writing algorithms or inventing algorithms or implementing algorithms developed by other people more efficiently or more correctly than other examples may be at your disposal. 
And obviously an algorithm is basically a step-by-step -step set of procedures to perform calculations and computations. And I think we're all familiar with algorithms, most likely from algorithms courses we've taken as undergrads or graduate students, as well as the kinds of things that we write day in and day out when we're developing software. It's also important, of course, to master programming languages. So nowadays, there's many different languages that are becoming popular or have been popular for some time. The old classics, the old standbys, C, C++, Java, the newer languages, some of them not so new, but some of which have become increasingly interesting lately. Things like Swift or JavaScript or Python or Scala or Kotlin. And these, of course, are the bread and butter of what we do as software professionals to make our living. We develop algorithms, we develop data structures, we apply the results of our modeling notations in the form of programming languages. So clearly having expertise on one or more programming languages, probably multiple programming languages, is crucially important to becoming a mass, master software developer. But it's also important to have something else as part of your bag of tricks, as part of your your quiver of arrows at your disposal. And this is understanding the recurring structures and behaviors that exist in well-designed software. And in some sense, the knowledge of these recurring structures and behaviors are even more important than the programming languages and the modeling notations. And sometimes, depending on what you're doing and what your role is in an organization, even more important in understanding the algorithms. Because that's what's going to enable you to build software systems that can expand and contract and be able to handle new requirements in new environments over the life cycle of complex and valuable software systems. And at the essence of this, of course, is the concept of software quality attributes. And these are fraught with the concepts that we're about to talk about. So one of the key software quality attributes, of course, is abstraction, which is an age old way of being able to emphasize what's important at some given level of abstraction and de-emphasize what's unimportant depending on what stage you're at, depending on what your role you play, depending on where you are in the life cycle of developing software, certain things are more important at certain times. And the role of abstraction is to help separate concerns so that you focus at the right level, at the right point, at the right time, in the right way. Something else that's important with software, especially software that has to live over a long period of time, is the concept or quality attribute of flexibility, which is really about being able to apply components in various ways that weren't originally anticipated. And it turns out that this is really important when you're building long-lived systems that have to last for years or even decades in some cases. And you wanna be able to rearrange things and adapt them and reconfigure them in all kinds of ways to adapt to new environments and adapt to new requirements. Along the lines of that concept of flexibility is the concept of reusability, which involves taking components developed earlier and then applying them in new contexts where they may not originally have been intended to be used. And of course, so software reuse, design reuse is really at the heart of what patterns are all about because they allow us to build upon the insights and the experience of people who've been there before, including ourselves if we build software in certain domains in certain areas long enough. We start, we start to learn the common roles and relationships and interactions, and we have a way of being able to reify or instantiate them so we don't have to rewrite them again from scratch using techniques like inheritance and dynamic binding and parameterized types and so on. Obviously, it's also important to build quality software. It doesn't do much good to have abstract, flexible, and reusable junk, which is garbage in, garbage out. So you want to be able to build software that is going to be able to withstand error cases. It's going to be able to withstand disconnects and partial failures and other kinds of things that we need to do in order to make sure our software is bulletproof so that small errors don't have rippling effects that break all kinds of things, usually at the most inopportune time when, when the customer is looking or the consumers are looking. Another key theme, especially as the software systems get larger and larger and tend to run in distributed environments connected by networks or using microservices or some type of software uh, defined architectures or various kinds of microservices architectures is the concept of modularity, which involves taking a large design space or a large problem domain and then breaking it up into smaller pieces that have low coupling but high cohesion. And if you think about what's happening these days with microservice style architectures, it's very clear that this is all the rage and being able to build 
systems out of modular pieces to get reused and reassembled in flexible ways at various levels of abstraction is really the name of the game for productivity boosts and being able to be providing more economic value to your customers. This also, of course, is crucially important nowadays to allow developers and teams to work independently. So you don't have to all have dependencies on each other where it takes a long time to build the software. You can work in parallel, develop in parallel, and then ultimately, of course, ideally run in parallel on modern multi-core systems running in cluster style environments. So it turns out that throughout all these recurring structures and behaviors we just talked about, there's valuable design experience. And this experience, of course, is, is quite valuable because it's really the secret sauce of what makes certain systems effective and scalable and reliable, and other ones not so effective, scalable, or reliable. Unfortunately, this type of design experience has historically been hard to access. It was like searching through a maze. And the reason for this is twofold. It's either been buried in the heads of the experts, the senior developers, the tech leads, the software architects, who see the big picture, but also understand the details of how everything fits together. So that's one place this information historically has resided. Or it's been buried deep in the bowels of the source code. And of course, if it's in either of those places, if it's in deep in the bowels of the source code or in the heads of the experts, you've got problems. Because if the experts decide to leave or they get amnesia or they get hit by a bus, then you've got a big problem because no one knows what's going on. Likewise, if it's buried deep in the bowels of the source code, a tremendous amount of time and effort, tedious and error prone time and effort is required to extract and re-extract this information every time you want to add a new feature or fix a bug or port to a new operating system or a new middleware platform or whatnot. So it's clear that we need something more than buried in the heads of the experts or buried in the bowels of the source code as a way to codify and be able to access all this design experience. So what we need, of course, is a principled means of being able to extract, document, convey, apply, and preserve this expert design experience without undue effort, time, and risk. Well, how are we gonna do that? Well, of course, the way we're gonna do that is by knowledge of software patterns. Also, along with the other things we talked about, knowledge of algorithms, knowledge of modeling notations, knowledge of programming languages, and so on and so forth. So what is a software pattern? A software pattern is a description that captures a solution to a common problem that arises within a particular context. And there are many different contexts in which software patterns arise. We have the context of mobile devices like Android or iOS. We have the context of electronic trading. We have the context of aerospace or healthcare or you name it. There's lots and lots of different domains that have patterns that reoccur within a certain set of contexts in order to solve very recurring design problems. There's also, of course, patterns that arise in the context of civil engineering. For example, one of the common things you'll see in certain parts of the United States is the concept of a jug handle or a J-turn, which are ways of being able to make left-hand turns without requiring left-hand turn lanes. And that's a very common pattern for anybody who's ever driven around New Jersey. You see these jug handles all over the place. And you may ask yourself, why are they there? Well, they're there because of the history of road systems in a very densely populated state like New Jersey, where the roads grew from footpaths to horse paths to buggy paths to two lane highways and then kind of stopped. They couldn't grow much wider. So rather than trying to widen the roads and put left turn lanes in, instead they apply the jug handle pattern, which you can see in this diagram here. So you can make a left hand turn without blocking traffic behind you by using the jug handle as essentially a queue to queue up cars that want to go left by basically going in a circle to the right. So I'm just pointing that out as an example of yet another domain where patterns occur that you might be surprised at first glance that those are also patterns too. Obviously not software patterns, but interesting patterns nonetheless. So what do patterns actually help us do from a software development point of view? Well, they help us improve software quality and developer productivity in a number of ways. First, they name recurring design structures. So rather than having to look at these in terms of their constituent classes and objects and structs and methods and so on, and get lost in the weeds or lost in the trees in the forest, 
Instead, we can give names to recurring micro architectures or collections, or small collections of classes and their roles and relationships. So as an example, you can see here the observer pattern, which is a classic pattern from the Gang of Four book we'll be talking about a lot in this series. And the observer pattern defines a one-to-many dependency between objects so that when one object changes state, all the dependents are notified and updated. And if you take a look at the diagram, you can see that we've got a subject, an observer, and a concrete observer. And those are the elements that make up that pattern. Patterns also help by specifying design structure explicitly by identifying the key properties of classes and objects. For example, the common roles and relationships. We've got a subject role. We've got an observer role. We've got a concrete observer role. We talk about the relationships. You can see that a subject may have multiple observers. You can see dependencies. The observer is used as the base class of the concrete observers. So you can specialize and customize and override methods. We have interactions. When someone calls notify on the subject, then it iterates through the list of observers and dispatches them by calling their update method. And then there are various conventions. And the conventions could be things like the observer and the subject run in the same thread of control, or the observer and the subjects run in different threads of control, and they use some kind of inter-process communication or remote method invocation mechanisms to talk back and forth and so on. Now, when we talk about the concepts of objects and classes in the context of these patterns, always take that with a grain of salt. You can use these patterns with C, which doesn't have any objects or classes. You can use these patterns with assembly code. Of course, we tend to use them with languages like C++ and C Sharp and Java and Python and so on that do have classes and objects. But never think that the patterns are limited to an object-oriented context, because they're not. That may be the preferred embodiment in some books, but the concepts are broader than that. And I'll demonstrate that as we go through the material. Something else that patterns do a really nice job of is help to abstract away from concrete design elements. We don't have to be overly concerned with the problem domain when we talk about the observer pattern. You can apply the observer pattern for GUIs, for word processing tools. You can apply it to distributed systems. You can apply it to all kinds of things. You can apply it to the Excel spreadsheet. You don't have to worry about the form factor. You can have it in different languages, different vendors, different operating systems, different hardware. And so we don't have to think about those things when we think about the pattern. The pattern is more generalized than any specific instantiation of the elements in a particular incarnation or a particular instantiation of the pattern. Something else that patterns do a nice job of is they distill and codify knowledge gleaned from years and years and perhaps decades of successful design experience from experts. So for example, if you take a look around at the observer pattern, you'll find that early uses of observer go way back to the 1970s in the form of small talk and its model view controller framework. Likewise, if you fast forward about a decade, you'll see it also appears in something called tool talk, which is a pub sub middleware developed by Sun to be able to do integration between their various tools running over the remote procedure call environment and the network file system of the day. So patterns help us avoid reinventing the wheel for these common software problems. So we don't have to start from scratch. We don't have to learn through the painful uh, trial and error period or through the school of hard knocks that the original developers who came up with these patterns had to do way back in the day. 